guys, welcome back to Not Just Mecha, it's Marco here and today is the last episode of the speed painting series dedicated to Cursed City. Every single box game out there brags about the crazy number of models packed inside the box and Every single box game out there reaches that crazy number with a bunch of what in card games is known as chaff. In the micro universe of that specific board game, every little miniature and token has its reason to exist, but from the point of view of modeling and painting, that's the boring part of getting the box ready for gaming. Here the chaff is one third of the box, and it's represented by the 20 models of the little vermin horde of rats, vampire bats and mission tokens. This whole series is focused on speed, but when it comes to the basic minions, you really want to move at light speed. So here I cut every possible corner, focusing on the most essential parts of the three fundamental columns of painting, color, contrast and definition, to complete the job in less than two hours. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel. And if you want to support my work, like, comment, share, watch another video, and maybe check my Patreon page, where you can find the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! The aesthetic goal is again to create diversity inside the general uniformity of the warband, or uniformity through diversity if you prefer. So I'm going to use the same ideas and principles I used in the last few videos, but mixing and matching those techniques to create another different speed painting workflow that will deliver a slightly different visual output for every single model, still keeping them harmonious as a unit and part of the rest of the army. To get all these in the shortest time possible, I fuse in the first stage the three core tricks I use on skeletons, zombies and vampires. I start with the general coat of black primer to create my lowest and darkest value that I plan to use for an eye contrast sketch of the volumes like I did on the skeletons. But instead of using white to set the volumes, I use uh, colored primers like I did working on the vampires, but uh, the logic of their application is more the one I use on the zombies. The single steps are extremely simple and straightforward, and you saw their basic principles in the recent videos, so here I get the chance to go deeper into the explanations, focusing a bit more on the reasons why this stuff works. I really want you to be able to transfer and adapt these ideas on every other project, and understanding how everything behaves and interacts, you can make them really universal. I use a single color for every bat, so they will look internally more compact, but the unit will deliver a ton of subtle diversity when they are packed together. Painting animals and beasts, I like to introduce some variety to make them look more realistic, or at least uh, different from troops with a proper uniform, and the intentional unified look it creates. The other side of the coin is the random application of the same basic tones that I use on the rats. Painting the humanoid vampires, I use the idea of colored primers to set the foundation of a smooth flow of progressive shades, but here I use it to create the illusion of a chaotic swarm, made by single little elements all slightly different. I probably didn't highlight enough this aspect in the last videos, but the simplicity of these techniques hides a lot of reasoning in the color theory department. My enemies are visually ranked based on the saturation of their colors, to show their relative place in the power and food chain of the city with how much blood and flesh they can eat. On the vampires I was super careful in overlapping and putting next to each other only colors that can mix uh, in an harmonious way, creating uh, new vibrant and saturated tones. Red, magenta and blue are a good example, because they are progressive in the color wheel, and their mix creates powerful shades of violet, able to gently connect the cold and warm tones with the natural flow. Here on the zombie rats, I don't have any problem in overlapping the complex, relatively warm tone of the violet with a muted green. In the core of their application they are still strong use, but Thanks to their complementary position on the color wheel, I know that the shades created around their borders will tend to a nasty grey tone, much more interesting than a grey created with a simple black and white, but still a true vibrancy killer. Not to mention this uh, touch of brown, used in the final stage as last point of connection between the different hues. Brown is a great bridge color because it contains the primary tones of every color theory system, 
so it can be used to fix and connect even the craziest transition, especially if you are looking for realistic colors from the everyday world, but for these same reasons it will kill the saturation where applied. Carrying different proportions of every major tone, you can be totally mathematically sure that two or more complementary tones will meet, neutralizing each other in an explosion of grey and desaturated shades. The second stage of the plan is the proper high value zenithal light, and to push even more on the theme of the balance between diversity and uniformity, I use a grey on half of the models and a light skin tone on the other half. These layers unify all the random tones under a compact general look. The highest lights get the vibe of the environmental light I use on the rest of the army, but all the previous colors are still there, in the light and dark midtones, and of course in all the shadows. I used uh, different quantities of pure white on every other model of the set, but here I completely skip its extreme uh, light value. These models are quite literally at the ground level, and when they are next to the other figures, I want a clear visual jump between the quantity of light caught by the large shoulders of the Varskir for example, and the lower values on a rat or a little zombie cat. You can easily see here on the bats how the colors of the underpainting still influence their look in a super strong way, but when you see them all together the zenithal colors get a priority, creating more general uniformity in the two main blocks of flesh tone and grey. At this stage it's still pretty obvious that these are only two main foundational tones, but oil paints will do all the rest. Before moving to oils I quickly take care of the bases. I don't have time to lose, and since the models already contain a good quantity of brown in the shadows, a bit of overspray can't do any real damage, so I can safely use the airbrush and keep running. As a bonus, the fine mist of the light overspray also creates a good weathering effect on ruins and columns. Same spirit applying a quick coat of contrast Blood Angels Red on a couple of details, like the roses on the tombstones. and a flat covering layer of gold and silver here and there. Never underestimate the unifying power of the bases and their rims. Most of the time what you perceive as color coherence in an army is coming 99% from the bases. Nobody will really notice if a unit in your ultramarine army has a slightly different shade of blue, but change even a bit the tone of the bases and the army will become a mess. Like working on the zombies, my selection of oil paints covers almost every major slice of the color wheel. Black is always there for the darkest values, and it's a main component of my bases since the beginning. I have two warm tones in the form of magenta and a deep red, paints grey for the blue, sap green to boost the sensation of rotting flesh and main source of yellowish notes, and two browns to use as balancing factors, burnt amber more in the red spectrum, and Van Dyke brown for a lighter orangey contribute. The only basic tone missing in its pure form is yellow, and that's because, uh, contrary to acrylics, uh, yellow oil paint has a crazy opacity and covering power that doesn't work well for transparency effects, even at extreme dilutions. This time I want the oils to do a lot of work for me, so I play a bit more with the timing of each layer and the consistency of each color. Using oil washes, the relation between the finish of the acrylic layer, the dilution of oil paints, and the time they stay on the surface can create an infinite variety of effects and modulation levels. As a rule of thumb, a matte surface absorbs more paint in a uniform way, so like here in my case it's a better starting point when you need to add tones and extra shades while a satin or even glossy finish works better for a sharp definition, because the wash cannot stick well on the raised open areas, and naturally flows into details and lower parts following capillarity and gravity. An important factor to consider when working with transparent oils is how much time you leave them on the models. Everybody knows that oils take ages to dry. <laughs> 
But in reality, when you put on the model just a bunch of white spirit with a micro quantity of paint inside, things are really different. And a few minutes between the first application and the second make a huge difference in how they impact and stay in the surface. For this reason, working on the rats, I wash first the tails with magenta, because I want this tone to really soak into the previous layers and leave a strong chromatic mark. Dilution is intuitive because it works pretty much like with acrylics. Thicker paint delivers more pigments and literal saturation, staining more the surface. While adding more thinner, you get a translucent behavior. You can see on the palette how I prepared my dark colors, mixing a thick paste with just a bit of thinner, to the point where you can't really call these washes anymore. These tones will be, at the same time, my main source of definition and physical oily grime, so I want them to fill every detail and deep line of the sculpts with a consistent thick mass of pigments, to make them easy to read in the distance, even on these uh, small models. The job of the other tones is to apply a transparent filter on the basic sketch, adding soft and flowing chromatic sensations, so I push on their transparency and ability to move and mix with each other on the surface, using a much more thinner. I want to point out that the desaturating behavior that you see in action here and in the next phase is not intrinsic to oil paints, but something created on purpose by mixing precise tones and overlapping them on top of a conscious underpainting. The vibrancy and saturation of oils is on average higher even than the best acrylic paints, but on the channel I use them more for this kind of applications, so I'm starting to be afraid that I'm delivering a limited perspective on their use. Oil paints are coming back in full force in miniature painting, thanks to the great informative work of my generation of painters and content creators, and a lot of you are investing in this tool. So in the next future I want to reorganize all my content about oils, pushing more on their use for bright, clean and saturated painting, and proper general painting, to give you the full spectrum of their awesomeness. The cleaning stage here takes the simplest and most essential form possible. The objective is only to take off the overflowing excess, keeping a good amount of paint inside the details to compensate for the small size and low definition, and dry q-tips guarantee a low impact on the adhesion of the layer of paint, without absorbing or entering the details too much. Remember that you don't need to apply any strength or real pressure because the paint is completely wet and will steal a huge amount of white spirit inside that will make it super easy to remove. In the last stage I apply a quick, light definition using the same pastel colors I used on all the Cursed City enemies. I used to consider this set the weakest of the scale 75 artist range. All the colors are just basic hues in a tone of light grey, and you can easily create these tones by mixing, but if you need to paint a bunch of pale, desaturated models, you should consider adding them to your collection to speed up the work. The logic I follow here is a bit uh, counterintuitive, but it works well in a speed army painting context. I add extra details, definition and textures only on the largest and most visible open parts of the models. The idea is to optimize the visual impact of the time I spend on the models, making more interesting what's already interesting. It's a kind of subtle misdirection that mimics in a simple way the natural behavior of your eyes, that in real life perceive in high definition only the central part of your visual field. This way the main parts and focal points will look quite advanced, catching all the attention with a minimum amount of work. Even if the work was really quick, summarizing the amount of little interesting events and brushstrokes in a short video is a challenge. The theory is all here, but if you feel the need for more examples, you can find all the real-time footage I have from this paint job on my Patreon.
And here is the final result. I know they are not super exciting like the big heroes, but these are the kind of models that everyone has to deal with while painting a box game or an army. Even if they are not your main concern, they are still part of your force, and you want to maintain a consistent look and quality, so they are always an interesting challenge, where super efficient workflows are created. Plus, I'm really happy they gave me the chance to expand and talk about all the stuff I had to leave behind in the other videos to give you the full picture of all my planning and scheming. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe! Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community, or maybe ask for a commission! See you next week, guys!